If you have your Bibles there, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to read one verse. We're going to talk about many, but we're going to talk specifically, we're going to start with just this one verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Would you stand with me as we read this together? If you're able in respect to God's word, if you're able to. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning with many, many mixed emotions, Lord. Pray that you would be in charge of this sermon, of these words. Lord, I pray that the focus would not be on the one who's delivering the message, but on the one who the message is about. I pray, Lord, that whatever else is happening and going on in my life or anyone else's, you would be the focus. Not people, not emotions, not, not other junk, but you would be the focus of our service. Lord, if Satan is a a liar and he deceives us and he tries to take our focus off of what we should be focused on and that is you your word I pray that you bring us back to that and whatever we came in here today thinking about or looking at or focusing our minds on Lord I just pray that you would be what we focus on now and that we give you our attention that we'd soften our hearts and allow you to use us and allow you to mold us. That we'd be courageous enough to admit arrogance and fault, pride. That we would allow you to change us through your word. If there are things I've prepared that are not what you want, Lord, I just pray that you remove those things and that you would speak despite my faults and stumbling and issues, Lord, that you would speak and you would be the one that is given the glory today. Lord, we love you and we thank you for allowing us to study your word together with other friends and family, other church members, people who we love dearly. I pray that you would help us now to just learn from your word. For it's in your very precious name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Maybe seated. We started a new series last week. It came to mind because of um, the busyness of the holidays and the busyness and what it does to us. And it takes our attention off and the distraction causes distractions and it takes away our focus off of what we should be focused on, that is Christ. I saw a, a quote this week, I thought it was, I thought it was funny at first and I thought it was kind of sad, said, said, my life feels like a test that I didn't study for. Now you may be one of those students that says, well, I didn't study for most tests, so it didn't really matter, but for those of us that really, you know, obsessed about trying to get good grades, you know, that, that says something, right? That's, that's, that's how our lives feel sometimes, and, and it can get really intense during the holidays, can it? Especially Thanksgiving, Christmas, we, we have so many things around that, that we, we, we focus on sometimes instead of what is most important. You know, when, when trying to study for these sermons, it just, it's, it's amazing how studying for a sermon, it takes you down so many different paths and and you read something and it says, look at this. And you read something, look at this. And now oh, I want to preach about that and I want to talk about that. And boy, you can get distracted so much. God's word is so rich. 
Just so much in there. And one of the verses that, you know, were memorized when I was a child, but, but I, don't, I don't remember preaching on any time recently, came to mind. Revelation 3.20. Behold, Jesus says, he's standing at the door and he's knocking. I could still hear my grandfather preaching about that verse saying, you know, wrapping the word. It means wrapping or phone. I remember the word, him saying the Greek word. Making a sound at the door. Knocking. You know, he could just burst the door right in, couldn't he? He could do whatever he wants. He could knock the door down. But he very quietly just sits out and just kind of taps at the door, trying to get our attention. Trying to get our attention. Isn't that an amazing statement? God of the universe, who created everything, is trying to get my attention? As if I have something bigger and better to be looking at than him? Quietly just knocking, trying to get my attention. We start off last week by saying that we need to focus on thinking about how we can draw closer to Christ, becoming more intimate in that relationship with Christ. And as so many Christians stay at that superficial kind of level where they, they, they're saved, they do know the Lord, but they just stay there. And they never get really deep, and they still make all their decisions, and they still do everything based on what they want to do and how they feel. Never considering what God's will, what God's will is. Intimacy. And then the next step of that then comes the word simplicity. For so many people, they will never answer that call, that light tapping on the door, because they are simply just too busy to answer that. They've got so much going on, they literally don't have time for God. I want to let that sink in. They don't have time for Jesus Christ because they are so busy. That's people that are not saved. That should break our hearts. Amen? But what I'm talking to today, who I am talking to today is Christians who are saved and who have opened the door and let Jesus come in and sit down and then, like the worst hosts ever, went about your own business and just left him there and ignored him. You let Jesus in. You say, hey, Jesus, come on in. And you let him sit down, and then you go about doing a hundred other things, and he sits in the living room, no one ever talking to him, no one ever speaking to him, no one ever talking and asking questions. Superficial level. Too busy, trying to earn money, working hard, too busy working overtime to get that promotion that we feel like we deserve, too busy playing ball games or, or, or going here doing this or working at that or focused on something else or filling up our calendars. Anybody have your calendar on your phone? My phone is over there. Anybody have your calendar on your phone? One, two, three people. Okay. So the rest of you are uh, like the 1910s. You still have that big giant thing on your, on your, on your desk. Each, door is, each day is like that big. You can write whatever you want in there. Okay. Well, if you have it on your phones, and I, you know, some of you may have the iPhones. I don't know exactly what it looks like on there. Mine's not. But, um, you know, uh, you can pull up the calendar view. You can pull up the month view of the calendar. And you can pull it up as a list or whatever. And I, and I did this yesterday just to kind of give myself a, an image because I knew I was going to mention it to you today. And I pulled up November. It was two days in November where there was nothing on there. And, and I started laughing because I said, I know what's happening both of those days. I have stuff to do on both of those days. So it's not on the calendar, but I'm busy those days. 
And every other day has list, 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 list. We're so busy filling up our calendars, getting so busy, our lives, you're outlined there, our lives have become so cluttered, cluttered, that our affection that should be focused on Jesus Christ is fragmented and picked apart and pulled apart. And pretty soon, the focus of what should be the Lord's, a little bit's gone here, a little bit's gone there, a little bit's gone here, a little bit's gone there. And pretty soon, it's a very, very fine little line. And Jesus gets very, very little of our attention or our love or our focus. I mentioned to a couple people in my life, I can't remember who I mentioned to. I mentioned to them that I've been really working trying to move things from my calendar. And Satan is good that when you remove one thing, um, he tries to refill that, that spot up with two new things. So I'll try to remove one thing from my to-do list, and, and it is amazing. Within a day, I've got two more to go in there. It's amazing. And people will say, yep, I need to do less. I need to focus on God more. And then ask you to fill your calendar up more and more and more. And we're so busy, life has gotten so complicated. Do you remember when life was simple? Do you remember when life was simple? Like life has gotten so complicated now that it takes all of our effort just to try to figure out how to, I mean, how to program this and do that. I've got so many passwords, I can't keep track of all the passwords in my life. I, I have a set of a few passwords that I've run through, and I've run through them so many times now. All my passwords, when, I, when they tell me to reset, they say, no, you can't use that past password. You can't use that password. I'm thinking, I haven't used that password in like two years. But I've got so many passwords. There are now sites that you can get on that will keep track of your passwords. And you know how you get into that site? With a password. Yeah. Life has gotten so complicated that we can't get close to our Savior. We can't get close to our Savior. We mentioned this last week. It's just a matter of review. If you're going to get close to someone, if you're going to work on a relationship, it takes time. And you can't take time away and spend it on everything else and tell me that Christ is the center of your life when you spend six hours a day doing this and four hours a day doing this and two hours a day doing that and two minutes a day thinking about God. Don't tell me he's more important. He's not. He's way down here. And all those other things are more important. Let ask you a question. And this is a tough one. I don't know. You know, it's, it's one we have to ask ourselves. Are you happy with your Christian life? Are you satisfied with your Christian life? I mean, are you growing in Christ every day? Is it where you want it to be? Are you as close to Christ as you want to be? Is it where you want it to be? Are you becoming more like Christ every day, or are you becoming less like Christ? There is no um, neutral. You're either becoming more like Christ or less like Christ. More like Christ or less like Christ. The most important thing we can do is ask ourselves deep down inside, we said this last week, okay, listen, what's really important to me? What do I really want? Do I really want to be like Christ or do I want this and this and this and this more than my relationship with Jesus. Because I know you would never say that. Let's say work is your issue. Let's say that's the problem. That's a problem for a lot of people. It's more important than God because it takes all your focus away from God. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to work. And I'm not saying by anything I say today, by the way, that you should not work hard and you should not be the best employee. Christians should be the best employees. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying or what I'm about to say in this, in this sermon. But let's just take work, for example. 
We focus, we think about it, we work on it, we take care, we, we, we spend all this time on it. All we do is, is work on it, think about that, and then our free time is sometimes spent on thinking about how I can work better or trying to get an extra angle or get ahead on this project or do this and that. Spend all this time on that. And God gets no time. Do you really, really want, if you got to choose, if you, you, we say that we want to be close to Christ, but our actions oftentimes show something different. Our actions show that the work is more important than Jesus. You say, my family is number one. But your actions show that your family is about number 14. Talk is cheap. Anybody can say anything. It's become increasingly clear to me lately. You know, Christians say one thing, but their actions show me something different. I, I don't want to hear what you think. I want to see what you believe. Show it to me. Don't tell me that you think this is important or that you care about this or that you care about that when your actions don't show it. I'll give you the other example. Don't tell me work is important if you come in late, if you leave early, if you take, you know, two and a half hour long lunch breaks. If every time somebody looks for you, you're gone, you disappear. Don't tell me work's important. Show it to me. Don't tell me Jesus is important. Show it to me. Show it to me. Do you really want the things of this world or do you want the Savior? Well, we all say, oh, I want the Savior, I want the Savior. And then we go out and put ourselves in debt buying all the things of the world. Oh, I want the Savior, I want the Savior. And then we spend all the time doing stuff that feeds into our ego instead of doing what God's calling is for our life. You know what, Satan is so good at what he does. Satan would love nothing more than for you to be so busy doing church stuff that you forget all about God himself. You hear that? It hit me about halfway through the year this year, I don't know when, sometime in the summer, I guess, we always tease and laugh and talk about it, so I'm making this personal, okay, being transparent with you. Uh, we always tease and talk about, you know, we have so much going on for a small place, so much ministry, so many things happening. I'm just going to tell you right now, we have too much going on. If that bothers you, tough. We have too much going on. Too much to say that Jesus is number one. Period. Deal with that the way you want. We got to simplify our lives, people. The word is simplicity. We need to simplify our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is writing to the people in Corinth, his second letter. And, and we think there are some issues that were happening there to the people in Corinth. Remember that one? And we think there were some issues happening. People had been challenging him and where he was at, what position he was at, and, and his authority. People were really challenging him. People were stepping up within his, within his people. I've been reading 2 Corinthians. It's been a lot to me lately. And there's, and, and there's a lot of people that were in there that were supposed to be his number ones, and they were all supportive of him when he was there. And then as soon as he left, everybody started taking over and trying to push him out and saying they didn't have any authority and he wasn't valuable and God wasn't calling him to be there. And so he came in and he called him on it. And he said this verse in chapter 11, verse 3. He says, I'm afraid. And he compared it to like when Eve was tricked by the, ser by the serpent. Remember that one? He says, I'm afraid that your minds would be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. He says, I'm afraid that when you got saved, you were focused on Christ, and now your focus is on everything else except Christ. 
You look at your time, look at your calendar, and see what's really important to you. What's really important to you? Now, when I say simplicity, I don't mean uh, the way some people define it. I mean minimizing the number of things that we focus on so that God can be our priority. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. Following God is never going to be a simple thing because we are broken people in a broken world. So I'm, never going to, I'm not saying that it's going to be simple to follow God. What I'm saying is we need to simplify and, and lessen the stuff in our lives so that God can take more of our time. I go back to that analogy of inviting Jesus in and then saying, yeah, come on in here, sit on my couch. And then you leave him there all day and you never say a word. You never talk to him or deal with him. You just simplify. If that's what you're doing, you need to get rid of some of those other chores. You need to get rid of those and get back in the kitchen and the, the living room, wherever you put him, and sit in there and spend time with him. Simplify our lives. This reading that we had this morning, Matthew chapter 6, he goes on later and he says, we seek his kingdom by doing what? Searching him, loving him, going after him, pursuing him, running after him with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. Everything about us. That's the entire person there wrapped up in that one little verse. All of ourselves focus on him. Not just Sunday morning version of you, but all week he is the focus of all your heart, your emotions, your love, your, your desires. Everything is about him. Everything's about him. Everything's about him. You know, when a couple is dating and they go through that awkward, you know, puppy love stage. Remember those days? Maybe you tried to forget it because you had braces and you had like, you know, a weird hairdo or something. And, and then they go through that and then you get to that phase where you're ready to get serious. And, and you pop the question and you ask to marry. You say, will you marry me? What are you saying? You're saying, okay, before I was looking around, searching, seeking, dating, whomever. But now... My desire is only for you. Amen? Better be. It better be. Ladies, it better be. Men, better be. Right? Okay. We accept Jesus into our hearts. We open the door, we let him in. And then we put everything else on the front burner and we put Jesus on the back burner and we say Jesus I'm going to get to you I know memorizing scripture is important I'm going to get to that I'm going to get to that when I have time I know reading my Bible is important I'm going to get to that when I have time right now I got to focus on work you wouldn't have that work if it wasn't for Jesus giving it to you you wouldn't have the ability to do that if it wasn't for Jesus giving you that ability and oh by the way he could take it away just like that Focus on him. A singular focus on the Lord and his will for our lives. That's what we're talking about. That's simplicity. That's simplicity. Instead, most of us say yes to many things and we don't take time to focus on the important things. On the important things. We fill our schedules with things. We fill our schedules with people. We fill our schedules with stuff. We fill our schedules with, uh, you know, things we got to get done, and we don't focus on him. And here's the, you want to hear the sad part? The people that need to hear this right now are not focused on me because they're thinking about other stuff that they got to get done. And they got their heads down, and they're not listening. All right, 
So let's dig into this with some questions. I want to ask you some tough questions. And I want to challenge you to think about getting closer to Christ. And there's a point in your outline, if you've got the outline, there's a point in your outline where I ask you a question and there is no answer for it. It's a blank because only you can answer it. Because if you leave this, I, my, my opinion is that it, no matter how good you are at this, we can get better. No matter how much we focus on Christ, if you say this is not my problem, then you have a problem. Because we all have this issue. Because we can all focus on Christ more. I don't care who you are. Me, anyone else. We all can. Everybody. Okay? And there's a spot in there where it asks you, you know, one thing you need to put aside. I'm not asking you to make, you know, 86 different decisions today. I'm asking you before you leave today to consider one thing you need to do less so that you can give that time to God. You ever done a, you ever done a, a fast where you fast because you're supposed to be focusing on God? And then when you do the fast, you, you fill it. Let's say you don't eat a, a particular meal. Sometimes you can, do it, you can do it other ways too, not just meals. But, you know, you don't eat a particular meal. And then you replace, you don't just skip the meal and keep on going in life. It's not like you just work through lunch. You skip the lunch, but then you spend that time focused on God, praying, reading the Bible, whatever. You don't just skip it and then skip over it. I don't want you to just skip over it. Forget, I don't, I'm not asking you to just to get rid of something. I'm asking you to then replace it with Jesus because we need more of him. So let me ask you some questions. Number one, only you can answer these questions and I'm going to tell you, <laughs> a lot of us answer these questions dishonestly. A lot of us are going to answer these questions and not really tell the truth. As if you're fooling God. Number one, how much time do you spend with God? How much time do you spend with God? How much time? Some of you can't spend this 45 minutes of the sermon focusing on God because you focus on other things, let alone the rest of the week when there's not some yelling, screaming maniac up here trying to preach at you. I'm talking about the rest of the week you can't focus on God, let alone just 45 minutes. How much time do you spend with God? So I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Okay, let me ask you this. How much TV do you watch every week? Like I, I decided to start with one, you know, below the belt on me. Boom. I love watching old TV shows. Love it. I want to know what, you know, Ralph Mouth and Potsy Weber did at Al's Diner. I want to see it. I don't want to miss that. Okay? But I need a little less Al's Diner and a little bit more of God's Word. How much time do you spend watching TV? Some of us say, anybody got a show that you never miss? Don't be lying. Raise your hand. Thank you, honey. My wife was the first one because she's like, I know you see me watching that, dear, so I better raise my hand. And hers is very, she's really good. She's got one show, or maybe two, same night, back to back. Yeah. Um, so let's say you got a couple shows. Is that a fair number? Not too much, not too little? Let's say you got a couple shows a week that you watch. That's a couple hours. Um, you know, um, let's say you watch a little TV, you watch a little news, you might catch a game. But in the week, eight to ten hours, that's not hard. That's easy. A couple hours a night, 12, 14 hours. If we cut that in half, let's say you spend 10, I'll be conservative. Let's say you spent 10 hours a week watching some kind of television. If you cut that in five, if you cut that in half and you gave five hours to God, if you'd taken five hours more this last week and given it to God specifically, wholly, completely, 100% on God, where do you think you'd be right now? Better or worse? Amen? See, we got something beautiful. It's known as reruns. We got, we got, do they still have TiVo? Digital recording, whatever they have. Like, you could, you could see everything. You know, you can pull it up. You got, what is it, Hulu. You can watch all this stuff. You can watch it later. When you have time, watch it. Put God first. 
I'm not sitting up in here telling you to get rid of your televisions. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm trying to tell you God deserves more of our time. Number two, oh boy, this whole thing, this whole sermon is tough for me. It hits me. And, and here's the sad part. Those that know me will say, well, I hope he's listening to himself speak. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you some of these things are my challenges, okay? You want to pick me apart, you go right ahead. But you need to look at yourself. I've heard some of that lately. I'm just going to be real blunt now. I've heard some of that lately. You need to work on this. You need to work on that. You're right, I do. You're right, I do. But don't let Satan keep you focused on me and forget about looking at yourself. I know I'm not perfect. That's not a surprise. Thanks for reminding me, though. I appreciate the reminder. Number two. Do you need to say no more? People pleasers, I want you to raise your hand. It will please me if you're raising your hand. Therefore, you want to do it. Say yes. You want to say yes. You want to raise your hand because I want you to raise your hand. You want to please me. I know. I'm not just a member. I'm the club president. Okay? I understand. Are you? We've all been given gifts by God. Amen? Are you at the mercy of serving those gifts? Or are you serving the God who gifted you? Huh? I've got David over here. I'm going to use David because he's good at this. I don't believe he does this, so I'm going to use him as a good example. Okay? He's a good witness on this. But David's been gifted very well. Uh, he's, he's got an immense musical gift. Huge gift God's given him. He could very easily take that gift. It could very easily become a source of pride. And he could take it then and use it. And then pretty soon, the God who gave him that gift is forgotten. And the gift itself has made him the God. He doesn't do that. That's why I'm proud of David for a lot of reasons. That's one of those reasons. He doesn't have to be at church. He could be, you know, he could be playing keyboards for... Some famous band, I don't know. They still have keyboards and bands? I don't know. <laughs> they still have that? Do people still play the piano? Or... Okay, I don't know. God gives us those gifts. We should be using them for him. But see, when you're gifted, people are going to, they're going to pull at David. Can you go play this? Can you play for that? Can you do this? Can you do that? And, and if he's not careful, he'll think, well, then that's how I serve. It might be part of how you serve. But I'm going to tell you, I, I doubt that every single person that asks him to come play is part of God's will for him. So he's got to learn to say no. No. That's hard. You get into ministry, that's even harder. Because when a person in the ministry says no, what are we paying them for? I don't know. You tell me. What are you paying me for? If you can't tell, I'm doing a bad job. Do you need to say more? Number three. Oh, boy. Clutter. Clutter. Is your life too cluttered? You got too much stuff? Is there too much stuff in your life? The more stuff, I believe, a, a famous rapper, mo' money, mo' problems. A couple, three of you are laughing. Attaboy, Biggie. All right. Way to teach us, Biggie. Mo' money, pro mo' stuff, less time you got for Jesus. I didn't say stuff was bad. I didn't say stuff was bad. Some of you are like, man, I'm poor, so I must be really holy. <laughs> I didn't say that either. You got too much stuff in your life? Are you more concerned with keeping up with the Joneses or keeping up with God's will? 
Ask yourself, ask yourself a couple questions. When you left the house this morning, what did it look like? Oh boy, is there junk everywhere? If there is junk everywhere, you might need to think about getting rid of some of that junk. We got good friends called the Salvation Army. They'll come and take it, take it to them. You don't need all that junk. We don't need all the junk. We're coming up on Christmas here. I bet you, if you thought hard, you might remember one or two of the presents you got last Christmas. I bet you can't even remember everything you got. Junk. Amen? Anybody going to watch little kids open stuff this Christmas? You get to see little guys, little kids open stuff? That is awesome. They open it up, and they are so excited, and they play with it for about two minutes while the next person is opening, and then it gets pushed aside. Not to be picked up again until April. <laughs> Junk. They had to have it. Adults, we are no better. Amen? You had to have that. Oh, I don't want to say it because then you're going to think I'm talking about you. You put it in there. That big purchase that you're on payment three and you've got 57 more payments to go. You know what I'm talking about? You got 57 more payments to go, and you're thinking to yourself, I probably should use it once or twice before I get to payment 60. <laughs> Junk. Stuff. Do you know the more stuff you have, then you're going to feel an obligation to use it, and the more times you use that stuff and that's, that junk, then the less time you're going to have for God. I am not telling you that a boat is bad, a car is bad, uh, a jet ski is bad. Uh, a whatever. I'm not telling you any of those things are bad. I'm telling you it's not necessarily everybody's will. It's not God's will for everybody to have those things. Too much stuff. Let me ask you another question. What does the trunk in your car look like? Your car trunk. Does everybody have a trunk? Hmm? You know what's in there? Or if you dug down, would there be some surprises and some rich treasures that you haven't seen for six months? <sighs> no? I'm just telling you, if it's cluttered, if there's a lot of junk in there, you may be a clutter person. Maybe you don't need it. Here's the worst one. Is your mind cluttered with a lot of things? that need to be removed from your life so that you can focus on God? I'm talking about like guilt. I'm talking about like uh, fear. I'm talking about like grudges. Those are big, huge pieces of, of clutter that get in the way of your mind focusing on Christ. You get it? Many of us came today with our minds focused on Christ. We said, man, we're going to come. We're going to worship. Uh, and then something happened. We got in a fight. We got in an argument. Somebody said something. Got us angry. And we've got that. Now we've got that little anger. And we've got that thing here. And we can't focus on Christ. And as Christ comes, we can't. Because i got this right here. coming. You know, it just keeps banging, banging, banging. I can't get. Because I can't clear that out. i got to clear that out. So I can focus on Christ. We don't have the courage to handle it the right way. We won't go one-on-one -on -one and ask somebody and talk to someone. We'd rather go behind their backs and talk. And so we have that and we have all that junk. And it's just more junk, more junk, more junk, more junk, more junk. And we can't focus on Christ. How about number four? Are you spending your time doing good things? Is your time spent on good things? Or is your time spent on the best things? I love the, right after, I don't know, man, I, I, can't, I think it was one of the very first, like, emails that I saw going around that everybody was sharing when I first got internet. And it was, man, you know, whenever internet, when, what, what politician invented the internet? <laughs> I'm just joking. 
I'm joking. You know, when the internet was invented, it was one of the first times I got, I think it was, you know, ding, ding, you know, one of those times where I get on the internet. And one of the first ones I saw was this, this great, like a, 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 a professor took the jar, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, and, and he would take the rocks, big giant rocks, and he'd put them in the jar, and he'd say, okay, is it full? And the kids would say, yeah, you can't get any more rocks in there. And then he would take the little pebbles, and then he'd put all the pebbles, and then he said, oh, is it full? And they said, yeah, you can't put anything else in there. Then he put the sand. He said, now, is it full? Yeah. And he said, no, you can put the water. And the thing finally got filled, remember? And it was supposed to represent the best things first. You get all of those in there first. Then you do the things that are good. And then, you know, down the line. But you do the good things first. Many of us, are, we spend all our time on the water and the sand. And never get to the big things in life, the important things. You do good things you can go, listen, you go to the gym, take care of your health, you know, exercise, eat right. Those are good things. But if you're focusing your life on that and not Jesus, you're focusing on the sand and the water and you got no rocks. You might have rocks in your head, but not rocks in the, not in the jar. You get it? I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments. I've had one of those moments in my past where I'm focused on something that's good and then all of a sudden I realize I'm letting this become too big of a deal and I got to get rid of it for a while. I'm not saying you can't come back to it, but you got to get rid of it for a while and get back into focus what's most important. If our kids become the most important thing in our lives, our kids are good. They're not the best. God's the best. Three amens. It's all right. I'm right. It's okay. God's the best. But we have the tendency to focus on our kids and put them on the pedestal when God should be on the pedestal. I, I love my wife. I want my wife to love her. But I want to make it clear I want God to be more important in her life than me. That's the best. Are you with me? We're five. Whew, here's a tough one. Another one below the belt. I punched myself a lot this week. Maybe you get it too. Are you leaving yourself enough time to rest? Isn't it fascinating that we have several stories in the New Testament that says that Jesus pulled away and you don't know what he was doing and he walked away from like big ministry opportunities and you're thinking, no, Jesus is going to go and he's going to witness to 5,000 more people. He's like, no, I need to chill. There it is right there in Matthew. Chillest thou. <laughs> if you think it's there, you need to spend more time reading the Bible. That's the one thing you need to do. Uh, we need to rest more. We need to take more time. Now, I want to be careful. I want to mention this. We're out of time. I want to mention this. Those people that don't work hard enough, they're, they're saying, amen, amen, amen. There's got to be a balance. You've got to work hard too. And then you've got to know when there's time to put that aside and rest and replenish he was all God. He was all man. That man part of him needed to rest, and he rested. He rested. Hmm. That's one of those best things. That's one of those most important things. You could work yourself to death. Happens all the time. I'm not minimizing what some of us go through with anxiety and stress and other things, some of that very much chemical, you know, stuff we need to get on, I, I understand that. But some of that is because we won't say no and rest. We won't bring it, we won't do that ourselves. Do that to ourselves, make ourselves rest. Another one, last question. Have you prioritized your home or the things that are outside your home? I've already talked about prioritizing God, so then next I'm going to go to the home and the family. Have you prioritized that, or is it stuff outside? See, that stuff outside is work, ball games, junk, all that stuff, all the things that we have in the garage and the, 
and the driveway, hobbies, all that stuff. That's outside the home. I'm talking about people in the home. Have you prioritized them? After God, below God, but still priority. Have you prioritized them? Or have you prioritized the things that are outside the home and you have very little time to be in the home with people because you are outside doing all this stuff. And you say, well, I'm doing all this stuff so I can provide for them in the home. B-O-L-O-G-N-A. That's baloney. Baloney. You're not doing it for everybody in the home. I'm doing this because I can provide for my family. Here, I got news for you. They want a little less provision. They want a little bit more you. Stop saying you're doing this for everybody else and, and start coming home and being there. Quiet. Crickets. Okay. Now, I'm going to say this again as we get ready to close. This sermon is not your permission to go to work and say, my pastor told me, boss, I need to do less, and you need to chill. It's right there in Matthew. Pastor told me, Matthew, chillest. He told me, you need to chillest. It's not your permission to go to work and do half effort. We are to be the best employees at the place. Not so people will look big on us, but so that we can bring a, a, a spotlight to Jesus. That's why we should do our best work. This is a plead for you to prioritize your relationship with Christ. I want you to take your relationship with Christ and say, it is more important than anything else. And so I'm going to start putting it in my calendar. I'm going to start, we'll put anything else in our calendars, won't we? I, looked, I started looking at things in my calendar. I mean, I got, you know, doctor appointments and meetings here and doing this and meeting that. And, and I, had, I mean, I had little things, like little small things, all put in my calendar so I wouldn't forget. Why not time with Jesus, prayer time, Bible reading? Why, not, why aren't those in our calendar? I'll be honest, because for many of us, it's not that important. That's why. You say, oh, pastor, you don't know that. You don't know what's important to me. I know it's not important because you're not doing it. You're not spending time on it. If it was important, you would spend time on it. Putting the first things first means that you have to say no to some things that are good, but you just don't have time to do them all because you got to get the first thing. You got to get the rocks done first. You got to get the big things done first. And it brings simplicity because you have to start saying no to some good things. And it's okay. And I, and I got news for you. That person you're telling no, they will live. They are not going to die because you can't do whatever. Could it be? that we're finding our value and what other people think of us rather than what God is calling us to do. Could it be? It means putting the best things first. And the other things will have to find their way. They'll have to trickle down like in that, that jar and that example. The other things will have to try to trickle down if they have room, if they have time, then they'll find time. But the most important things have got to be in there first. Number one, you got to know God better. How do you get to know God better? It's not rocket science. Bible. Reading the Word. Reading the Word. Prayer. Going to church. Spending time with other believers. Focusing on the Lord. It's not rocket science. It's not, you know, it's... It's the same prescription it's always been. Prioritizing knowing God better, number one. Number two, loving and caring for your spouse and children. That's right, I said it. That's next. Before everybody else, your spouse and children. Your spouse and children next. Taking care of them, loving them, watching over them, serving them, caring for them, spending time with them. That's next. Yes, closest friends also. 
I put friends in there. I had it out. I put it in. I took it out again. I put it back in. I really, I really debated about that. I don't want somebody to focus on that and put it in front of the other ones. Jesus, spouse, children, friends. And then number three, yeah, you do need to stay physically and mentally fit. How do you do that? You rest, you exercise, you eat right. It's the same stuff. It's the, it's the regular stuff. It's the, it's the stuff that we know how to do. When we get so busy, we won't. By letting yourself get so busy that you feel like you have to stop at McDonald's five times a week, you're hurting yourself. And you're, I'm, I'm not up against McDonald's. I, I'm not trying to sit up here and say, you know, boycott McDonald's, okay? I'm just telling you that if you've gotten so busy, you feel like that's the way you have to eat because you don't have time to go anywhere else, then you need to change your schedule. Listen, nobody loves McDonald's fries with the extra salt more than me. I believe they're somehow going to be involved in heaven in some way. I believe that's going to be Frank's job when we get there. He's, he's done before. He's going to be flipping those things. There you go. There's Peter's. There's mine. There's yours. There's John's. There you go, Link. Somehow, I love those things. That needs to be a treat. It needs to be something we do for fun, not something that we think we have to live on. Now our schedule's are too busy and they're not what's best for us. That's the schedule running you. That's not you running the schedule. Everybody's rethinking where they're going to go to lunch today. Sorry. As the musicians come forward, I I just want to close on this thought. If I were to take your schedule, and I'm sure there's some way to do it, you know, like the Chromecast or one of those things. If I was to take your schedule on your phone, if I was to take your phone and I was to do it and we were to, and I could shoot it up there onto the screen, would you be proud of it or would you be embarrassed about it? Just a real simple question. If I were to take it, you know what I'm talking about, you know, the project, you know, where you can send up all the Bluetooth and everything. If I was to do that, if I was to take your phone right now without even warning and I was to say, hey, let me see it. Anybody willing to show me? And, and I take it and I shoot it up there, would you be embarrassed? Or would it focus on God? Would that schedule tell me that you love God or would it tell me you love something else more? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. If you looked at mine, mine would say that this place is my God. That's what my schedule would say. Not God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Trying to be brutally honest with you here. My schedule would tell you, oh, he loves that place more than he loves God. I'm not saying don't love your church. I'm telling you it needs to take a back seat to God himself. That's what mine would say. What would your schedule say? If I shot it up there right now, what would it say? I was going to try to do that. And then I looked at it and I was like, that's just really boring. I don't know if they want to look at all that. I don't know if they want to see all my doctor appointments and stuff. What would your schedule say? God or something else, someone else? What do you need? Remember that blank in the middle of the outline. What do you need to get rid of? What do you need to do less of? Maybe not get rid of, less of. What do you need to do less of? And replace it with more God this week. Is there anyone here that could say, "Mm, there's no way I can push, I can squeeze another minute of God into my week this week. I just don't have any time. I've done so much God, I can't squeeze any more God into this week. Good answer. All of us can. Amen? So what are we going to put on that blank? What are we going to replace? What are we going to take and do a little less of and do more of God? Would you stand and sing with them?